One important way in which the transition metals differ from the main group elements is in their electron configurations and how we consider their valence electrons. In a main group element like silicon, the valence electrons are simply the electrons with the highest principal quantum number in the outermost shell. So the electron configuration for an atom of silicon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p2. And it's the 3s2 and 3p2 electrons that we consider to be the valence electrons because they have the highest principal quantum number, n equal to 3. In the transition metals, we consider as valence electrons both the n-1d electrons and the ns electrons. So we consider the s electrons in the outermost shell and the n-1d electrons, which are in the secondmost outer shell, but nonetheless still involved in bonding and still considered valence electrons. So for an element like vanadium, for example, which is in group 5 of the, of the periodic table, vanadium has the electron configuration of argon, which is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. It has two electrons in the 4s subshell and three electrons in the 3d subshell, and all five of these electrons are considered valence electrons. So when you're looking at the transition metals to count the number of valence electrons, start counting from the alkali metal in that period. In other words, if we were to look at vanadium's period on the periodic table, we would see potassium, calcium, scandium, titanium, and vanadium. And to count the number of valence electrons in a vanadium atom, we want to start not with the transition metals, which start with scandium, but actually with the potassium atom. So potassium has 1, calcium 2, scandium 3, titanium 4, and vanadium 5. The d electrons are considered valence electrons. In general, we can imagine the valence electrons of the transition metal atoms filling up in accordance with Hund's rule. That is, we can imagine the 4s level slightly lower in energy than the 3d orbitals such that the 4s orbital is filled first. This is group 1 and 2, the alkali and alkali earth metal in that period. And then we start filling the 3d levels in accordance with Hund's rule. So put another way, the Aufbau principle is followed here in addition to Hund's rule, where we don't pair electrons up, right? That's Hund's rule. And we fill according to the Aufbau principle, imagining the 4s orbital as lower in energy than the 3d orbital. There are a couple of exceptions to this rule. However, you want to keep them in mind for the group 6 and group 11 transition metals. As examples, let's take a look at the group 6 element chromium and the group 11 element copper, which have anomalous electron configurations that don't really fit with this Aufbau principle plus Hund's rule paradigm. The expected electron configuration for chromium being a group 6 element is the configuration of argon, 4s2, 3d4, in which the 4s subshell has filled first because it's lower in energy, according to this picture, and the d electrons have been filled in above it from there. Similarly for group 11, we can imagine copper having the electron configuration of argon plus 4s2, 3d9, for a total of 11 valence electrons, there it is in group 11, with two electrons in the supposedly lower energy 4s orbital and nine electrons filling the higher 3d levels. The actual electron configurations here are not these expected configurations. Instead of having two electrons in the 4s subshell, chromium only has one electron in the 4s subshell and has 3d5, five electrons in the 3d. Copper instead of having nine electrons in the 3D subshell, has 10 electrons and only one 4S electron. These exceptions have a couple of really important points to teach us about electron configurations and atomic orbitals. The first is that in general, half-filled and fully filled electron configurations are favorable, at least with respect to these configurations in which we've paired up electrons in the 4S subshell and left d4 and d9. So for example, if we draw out the 5d orbitals and the 1 4s orbital at a slightly lower energy, 
for the elements chromium and copper, evidently it's a higher energy situation to pair up the electron in the 4s orbital rather than putting it up here in the 3d where we can either achieve a half-filled configuration, so this is the electron configuration for chromium, or a fully filled configuration in the d orbitals, which is the situation for copper. If we back up to the chromium situation, there's actually a significant advantage to having each electron within its own orbital, which is that we minimize electron-electron repulsion. As soon as we pair electrons up, they have the same probability distribution, right? That's what the orbital represents, essentially. And so they tend to find themselves within the same regions of space. That leads to electron-electron repulsion. And that's an important factor dictating the most stable electron configuration. The punchline is that for both chromium and copper, we see a half-fill, that is a D5 configuration, or a fully filled, that is a D10 configuration, instead of the expected D4 and D9. Another important point to take home here that's more general is that the Aufbau principle is not a law of nature or a law of quantum mechanics. It's a guideline for filling the atomic orbitals, but in reality, atomic orbitals are not exactly a fixed scaffold. The atomic orbitals change their energies depending on occupation by electrons. So as we add electrons, the orbital energies can shift. This creates complications when we go to assign electron configurations, and ultimately, especially for the transition metals, we have to depend on experimental characterization of the atomic orbitals to tell us what the electron configurations are. So I would record these on your crib sheet so that you have them handy. There's no reason to memorize them, per se, as long as you appreciate that they exist and understand the importance of a half-filled D subshell or a fully filled D subshell for the transition metals in groups 6 and 11. We most commonly deal with transition metal ions rather than the metal atoms themselves. And one thing that's important to appreciate with the ions is that the ns, say the 4s electrons for the first row transition metals, are lost before the n-1d electrons, say the 3d electrons for those first row elements. It's worth taking a moment to appreciate the reason for this because it actually goes back to effective nuclear charge, which is a concept we've talked about before in 1211. To explain this, I want to look at the shapes of the 4s and 3d atomic orbitals, and in particular, pay attention to the average distance of the electron from the nucleus. So here we're looking at the 4s atomic orbital. We can see that the, at least the modal distance is here at 24.7 A0. A0 is just a unit that corresponds to the average distance of a 1s electron from the hydrogen nucleus. So we'll just treat it as a unit here. We've, we've got a, an average, or a modal distance rather, of about 24.7 units from the nucleus, which is sitting right here. Here's a three-dimensional image of the orbital with phases represented as different colors. If we now transition to the 3d orbital by decreasing the principal quantum number and going up to L equals 2, which is the d subshell, we can see that the electrons in this orbital are much closer to the nucleus than they were in the 4s case. Here we're only 9 units away from the nucleus. But in the 4s case, just to go back to that, we see we're much farther out. The fact that the 3d orbitals are much more compact and closer to the nucleus than the 4s orbitals means that they're affected more strongly by the change in z effective when an electron is lost from the atom. So losing an electron from the atom increases the effective nuclear charge because shielding goes down. The electrons affected most strongly by that are those closest to the nucleus. They're pulled in much more tightly to the nucleus as a result of the loss of that negative electron. Since the 3d electrons are closer, on average, to the nucleus than the 4s electrons, they experience a larger drop in energy. This means that in ions of the transition metal atoms, the 4s subshell ends up higher in energy than the 3d subshell. This is inverted relative to the situation we're used to with the 3d electrons higher than the 4s. The consequence of this is that in transition metal ions, we can basically ignore the 4s level and treat all of the valence electrons as residing in 3D levels.
Let's look at a couple of examples of this phenomenon in action. So let's consider the Fe2 plus ion first. So a neutral Fe atom has the electron configuration argon 4s2 3d6. Because the s electrons are lost first, and loss of an s electron lowers the d orbitals below the energy of the 4s orbitals, when we subtract two electrons from this electron configuration, we end up with argon 3d6. This may seem a little bit weird if you think about it, because we imagine the 4s orbitals lower in energy than the 3d orbitals in the neutral atom, but we imagine the 4s electrons lost first, quote unquote. This is because the loss of an electron and the increase in effective nuclear charge causes the d orbitals to dip below the s orbitals in energy. Going back to this point about electron configuration being dependent on the number of electrons in the atom in a rather complicated way. Another nice example is titanium 2 plus. A neutral titanium atom has an electron configuration of argon 4s2 3d2 and here the two electrons lost are not the two electrons in the 3d subshell but the two electrons in the 4s subshell. So the resulting electron configuration is argon 3d2 in the Ti2 plus ion. A good rule of thumb for ions with charge of plus 2 and higher is just to remove the s electrons first and then start removing the d electrons if necessary for plus 3, plus 4, plus 5, etc.